This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and we are here today to talk about the sort of most epic smackdown that I have seen of late. We saw last week, I guess it was, that a lawyer got arrested in court because she read the law to the judge, much to the offense of the judge who felt like he was being spoken over. And this was a very controversial video for our audience and the outside audience. There were lots of comments in the extremes in both directions. I saw everything from that the judge did the right thing, to the attorney should be, should have been arrested, to things about the protesters and the counter-protesters, and... Well, here we are to clear a lot of that up. Because I have a lot more information now. In fact, we even have video from the protest that I'm going to make a fair use of, and we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happened to the protester, to, we'll take one example of a protester who was arrested and then the prosecutor later tried to dismiss his charges and that's where Susan Church got arrested. So this is in Massachusetts, this is in Boston. Uh, I'm not going to say certain words because we know how YouTube censorship goes, but we know what kind of march this was. No one is, is there's, there's no secrecy about what kind of march this is, but I'm not going to bring up what the march was for, and I'm not going to bring up, uh, you know, the protesters' demands and all that. We're going to talk about the law. We're focusing on the way the law works, why it works the way it does, why things played out the way it do, what, what the way it do, and in the process, I think you're going to be really entertained by the prosecutor who had to go to bat for the defendants. How often does that happen? The prosecutor. The district attorney, or maybe assistant district attorney, it was the assistant district attorney in court because it was a routine matter. Now it's the real district, the full district attorney, who is arguing on behalf of the defendants. Just, just take a second and absorb that. The prosecutor asked for the charges to be dismissed. The judge said no. The judge said that there are victims here, there are victims of this protester's actions, and those victims have not consented to this punishment or, or dismissal of the charges. We're going to find out why that's completely untrue and irrelevant and doesn't matter at all because that's not what happened. We're going to find out what happened to the arrestee, not Susan Church, but the protester that was arrested. Now, there were more than one protester, so we're going to take a example, the example that the district attorney chose to use, and we'll make some things very clear about what kind of protester this was, and what kind of protest, and what kind of resisting arrest it was, and what kind of charges. That's all going to be made clear. So please stick with me. We will get through this together, and I promise you we will all be the better for it, and everyone will understand why what was done was done. You are still 100% welcome to disagree with what happened or why it happened or all that, but you should know why it happened from their perspective, from the law's perspective. Because if you know what happens from the law's perspective, then you are empowered and you'll know what can be done next time. These protesters' protests could have been much more effective had they simply followed some very, very basic rules of law. And I'm not even talking about rules that make their protest ineffective. I'm talking about rules that can make their protest more effective. So let's go over it. Let's start with the appeal from the district attorney of the city of Boston now, I have intentionally redacted out the name of the protester, not because I need to be super secret about the name of the protester, but rather I know there's a lot of controversy on both sides. Uh, we will post an unredacted copy of the appeal and the Supreme Court's ruling, and we'll post, well, you'll be able to find the link in the unredacted appeal to the Facebook video so you can see the entire video for yourself. 
because I have edited the 11 minute video down to a little over a minute and a half, and I'm sure someone will accuse me of editing something important out. And that's not my intention. I tried to only edit to the highlights that I wanted to talk about, so no lack of transparency, no opacity here. We will post these things for you to see. I'm just not going to do it during my live stream for just everyone's sake. So this is in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is the emergency petition of the district attorney for relief from the Boston Municipal Court's unconstitutional refusal to accept the Commonwealth's null prosecute or null prosequi. I'm just going to call it a null pros. So first, let's see what GLC which I think is General Legislative Consolidated Statute 211, Section 3. Let's see what that has to say so we at least know why we are here. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts says the Supreme Judicial Court shall have general superintendents of all courts of inferior jurisdiction to correct and prevent errors and abuses therein if no other remedy is expressly provided. I'm not going to go any further there because the prosecutor will explain further in the appeal document. Let's continue. The Commonwealth respectfully requests that this honorable court exercise its extraordinary powers under GLC 211 Section 3 to order the Central Division of the Boston Municipal Court to accept the Commonwealth's null pros in the above-named case. In an unprecedented action, a justice of the Boston Municipal Court, Senate J, or rather Judge Senate, refused to accept and recognize the Commonwealth's absolute power to enter a null prosecute and terminate prosecution of the criminal complaint. In doing so, the judge ignored the clear and unambiguous constraints placed on the judiciary by the separation of powers enshrined in Article 30 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, the Massachusetts Constitution, and ordered the defendant's arraignment on a complaint the executive branch chose not to prosecute. The Commonwealth's filing of a null pros is a constitutionally protected action that affords the prosecutor the right to exercise her judgment in the prosecution of cases and the allocation of limited prosecutorial resources to protect public safety. The Commonwealth asks this court to hold as unconstitutional the judge's refusal to accept and recognize a duly filed null prosecute in the instant case exercise its extraordinary powers to vacate the lower court's order arraigning the defendant. Remember, the defendant was arraigned uh, in abeyance or in ob under the objection of the district attorney who wanted this case dismissed. So the, the, the defendant now has a criminal record because they have been arraigned. And arraignment means they've been read the charges and the judge has found the charges to be prima facie or, or at least at least good enough to go to the next phase of a, of a, of a pre-trial process. And they ask to remand the Boston Municipal Court, or rather to, to remand to the Boston Municipal Court to allow the Commonwealth to exercise its constitutional right to file null prosecutes in the prosecution of this case. The, they will also ask to order expungement of the defendant's criminal record. You'll see that later. On September 3rd, 2019, a complaint issued from the Central Division of the Boston Municipal Court charging the defendant with one count of disorderly conduct in violation of GLC 272, Section 53B, if anyone wants to go look that up. This is critically important. This wasn't the district attorney or assistant district attorney bringing charges of assaulting a police officer or worse. This was the police department bringing charges of disorderly conduct. Keep that in mind. We are only talking about someone who committed an offense of disorderly conduct, 
not someone who's accused of assaulting a police officer or throwing things at police officers, which would be assaulting a police officer. That's not what we're talking about here. So just, just so we can be sure, I'm not saying that there weren't people who did that, but that's not what we're talking about. That's not what the district attorney is trying to dismiss here. I saw a lot of people who had that misconception in the last video, so let's clear that up right now. We are not talking about people who committed more egregious acts than disorderly conduct. Let's continue. That same day, the Commonwealth provided the Honorable Richard J. Sinnott with a null pros for the complaint. Over the Commonwealth's objection, the judge denied the null pros request purportedly because of the Commonwealth's failure to comply with GLC 258B, Section 3 which I didn't bring up in time for the stream, but what that one says is that for charges which involve victims, if you are a victim of a crime, the prosecutor can't simply dismiss charges without first consulting the victim of the crime. So, the judge is saying, by, by denying the null pros because of this failure to comply, the judge is saying that the prosecutor did not consult with the victims of the crime uh, who's the victims here? Maybe the uh, police officers who who arrested this person. Maybe it's the the victims are the the permitted marchers who had a permit to march the mile to whatever they're marching to. I think it was Town Square or something, and had their march interrupted by these protesters. So the judge thinks those are the victims, and that's fine. You can think those are the victims, but let's see how the law considers them victims or not. The judge then proceeded to arraign the defendant over the Commonwealth's objection. Following arraignment, the judge set bail at $750. So, so wait a second. The judge threw the people in jail and set bail at $750. But the maximum fine for disorderly conduct as a first-time offense is a fine of only $150. Doesn't that seem maybe a little disproportionate to you? Hmm. Prior to this arraignment, the defendant had no criminal record in Massachusetts. So we are talking about a first-time offender, at least in Massachusetts. Somebody can go figure out whether this person has some massive criminal record elsewhere, but in Massachusetts, this was a first-time offender who had no criminal record. So we're not talking about some person who has committed egregious acts before, at least in the state of Massachusetts. If the judge's refusal to recognize the null pros is not corrected and the case is allowed to proceed, the prosecutor's constitutionally guaranteed discretionary determination not to prosecute will be thwarted. And you heard me say this in the previous video. The prosecutor has the absolute right. And I'm not making words up there. I mean, the prosecutor is given the right, and the right is absolute. That means there is no discretion on the part of the judge to thwart the prosecutor's request for null pros at the correct time, and this is the correct time. Moreover, Judge Sinnott's arraignment of the defendant over the Commonwealth's objection creates an entry in his quarry, which I'm assuming is the criminal records information database for Massachusetts. A significant action, particularly where, as here, the defendant does not have a criminal record in Massachusetts. The Commonwealth thus seeks relief through GLC 211 Section 3 because the circumstances are extraordinary and there is no other adequate relief in law of Judge Sinnott's refusal to accept the null, pro the null prosecchi and subsequent arraignment of the defendant over objection. Facts. The Straight Pride Parade and Defendant's Arrest. Maybe we should watch the video first. Do you all want to watch the video first? How about, how about we watch the video first? One second, because I just realized that I forgot to bring the video up into Firefox where I need it to show it to you. And we will watch the video. Now, I think I should maybe... Yeah. I think I should maybe... Um, tell you that this video does show a protest. It does have people shouting things. I think I got all the curse words out of it. I think I managed to edit 
around the curse words, but if you don't want your children, or if you're in a not suitable for work scenario or something, maybe this isn't a great video to watch for the next two minutes. So please pay attention and, 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 and okay, let me, let me also preface, this is edited. I have edited this 11 minute video down to a little over a minute and a half, just to show you the highlights. Hopefully that will be enough, but if anyone would like to see the full video, I will provide a link by releasing the unredacted appeal and Supreme Court opinion after the stream, okay? So let's go, I might stop this once or twice. Let's go and let's see what uh, is going on here. And for some reason we are muted and I can't seem to unmute. Why can't I unmute? That's not strange. One second. We have technical difficulties. Yep. Let me see if I can bring it up then via uh, VLC here or something because it is not playing any audio in Firefox. Because that makes sense, right? Did, did Firefox start muting things and I can't unmute them now? Unmute. It's, yes, yeah, it's, it's not letting me unmute. That's not good. I do want you to hear a little bit of it too. So let's see if I can quickly add a, yeah, that's not, that's not helping anyone right now. Let's see if I can just briefly add a video source, VLC video source. Okay. I didn't even know that was a thing. I don't think that's going to work either. Grr. Oh, I can't even delete the video source now. Remove, remove. Yes. Let's add, can we do window capture? And can we capture VLC? Okay. That's one of them. Do we have another? I have another copy of VLC open. There we go. And of course it's black. <laughs> that doesn't help anyone. Yeah, and if I click play here, that doesn't actually do it. Arg! Technical difficulties. Um, yeah, I would love to know why my video is muted in Firefox. That would be really nice to know. We have not had this trouble before. All right, well, I guess we're just gonna have to show the Firefox video without uh, unmuting. So what's happening here, there is a protest behind those police officers. The police officers are using their bicycles to move the protesters or, or counter protesters, I guess they're protesters, back. And they stop eventually at this intersection and there's a little bit of an interaction. Everyone's just more or less shouting. Uh, no, I can't do Chrome because Chrome doesn't, doesn't work either. Chrome is just black. So then the police officers continue to move these people forward. Here is our RSD here in the hat, in the blue shirt. Later on, the, he uh, is continuing to be part of a crowd that is blocking the road. And at some point, round about here, the police move in and start arresting people. There really wasn't an order to disperse, and you can see that this protester is running away. He is, he is dispersing at this point, but no, this police officer is chasing him, captures, captures him, puts his arm around him, and they take him to the ground. In the process, they hurt his leg. And he eventually becomes compliant. He doesn't resist. No police officers get hit. Nobody is assaulted. Uh, except, you know, any argument you want to make about this guy who was running away who got chased by police. So that's more or less what happens. And then at the end here, he asks for the police to be gentle with his leg that is injured. And they, they, they seemingly are gentle because they give him a moment and then they help him into the van. And he even asks them to be careful of his leg and they seem to be careful of his leg. So 
Sorry, I couldn't bring you audio for that. I really have no idea why not, but uh, that's what happened there. So, back to the prosecutor's description, because now, having seen that, and hopefully you'll take my, my, uh, my word at face value for that, uh, for that description, and assuming that uh, everything I said is accurate, let's see what the prosecutor has to say about this. On Saturday, August 30th, Super Happy Fun America, an advocacy group on behalf of straight people, held a straight pride parade in the streets of downtown Boston with approximately 200 participants. The defendant was one of approximately 2,000 counter-protesters. Outnumbered, the marchers were jeered and heckled during their mile-long procession from Copley Square to City Hall Plaza. At approximately 5 p.m., as the parade wound down, the Boston Police Department redeployed its bicycle unit to Congress Street behind Boston City Hall to guide the counter-protesters onto sidewalks and out of the way of traffic. After a counter-protester wearing a black rubber boot on his head used a megaphone to lead the counter-protesters chants, uh, you, you'll get to see it for yourself, I guess, but, but it, it wasn't doing a great job leading anything. There is very, it's a very loosely associated group, if you couldn't tell. The bicycle unit encircled the crowd to arrest them for being disorderly persons. The defendant used his megaphone to repeatedly call out, the cow goes moo. He asked the police, again through his megaphone, if they had an order to disperse and kettle us. When the police started to approach the counter-protesters, the defendant ran away and said, oh shit, oh shit. As the defendant ran away on the sidewalk at the intersection of Congress and State Streets, a police officer grabbed the back of his t-shirt, reached over his right shoulder, and pulled him back. According to the police report, the defendant continued to resist and the officer took him to the ground. While on the ground, he continued to resist by trying to stand up. The Commonwealth has reviewed the Facebook Live video posted by defendant, and the defendant's arrest begins at approximately the 8-10 minute mark. That, that, there will be the link for later. The police officers placed the defendant under arrest. Then, on September 3rd, prior to the calling of the case for the defendant's arraignment in the Boston Municipal Court, so that's, that's September 3rd, and I think, what did they say, the, the protest had been September 2nd or something, so it was either later the same day or it was later the, uh, the next, you know, it was September 3rd, so it was later the same day, So later the same day, on September 3rd, prior to the calling of the case for the defendant's arraignment in the Boston Municipal Court, the Commonwealth had filed a null prosecchi in the case. Judge Sinnott refused to recognize that request and denied it, explaining that the Commonwealth failed to comply with GLC 258B Section 3, known colloquially as the Victim's Bill of Rights. The judge contended that the Commonwealth could not file a null prosecchi without notifying the parade organizers because they, the organizers, essentially could be considered victims whose First Amendment right to free speech had been impeded by the defendant's protest. The assistant district attorney objected to the judge's interpretation of the Super Happy Fun America parade participants as victims. She also objected to the court's refusal to recognize the Commonwealth's null prosecchi. So remember that they were challenged as victims. Are the Super Happy Fun America Parade participants victims in this case? Well, there is a, 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 a very clear legal definition to this, so believe it or not, whether you or I think they were victims or not doesn't actually matter because the law defines how victims are handled under a charge of disorderly conduct. When the clerk called the case, the defendants... Actually, let's read this, this, this uh, section real quick here. Um, 258B Section 1 defines a victim as any natural person who suffers a direct or threatened physical, emotional, or financial harm as a result of the commission or attempted commission of a crime. When the clerk called the case, the defendant's attorney, Christopher Basso, replied that his client was in the hall. So this isn't even Susan Church's client. This just also this happened to another, uh, another uh, person who was charged with disorderly conduct. Court hey, officers... Leonard, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but when you go to full screen, if the VLC player is still blocking your face, just wanted to let you know. 
Oh, thanks. Really appreciate that. I will go back here and there we go. Done. See, that's the, how these things happen. Okay, thank you. Back here. Court officers had refused to allow defendant into the courtroom to answer on his case because he was wearing a baseball cap. Because the defendant made himself unavailable, Judge Sinnott then ordered a default warrant to issue, and court officers arrested the defendant minutes later on the default warrant in the hallway outside of the courtroom. The defendant removed his cap and the case was called again. Having refused the Commonwealth's null prosecchi, Judge Sinnott then arraigned the defendant again over the Commonwealth's objections. Following arraignment, the judge cited the defendant's financial resources and the nature of the circumstances of the offense charged in support of a bail order. Judge Sinnott hand wrote on the form reasons for ordering bail and the following endorsement refused to state where he lives, defendant refused to come into courtroom because he insisted on wearing his hat in exercise of his First Amendment rights. The court ordered bail at $750 the maximum fine for disorderly conduct as a first-time offense is a fine of $150. On September 4th, in an abundance of caution, the Commonwealth filed a notice of appeal of Judge Sinnott's refusal to accept the null prosecchi and subsequent arraignment of the defendant over objection. Let's take a moment. So that's some shit, right? So the guy didn't want to come into the courtroom with his hat off, in probably in some kind of defiance or contempt of court, sure. So the judge held him in default and ordered him arrested. He was arrested in the hallway and brought into the courtroom without his hat, where the case continued. So we're not talking about some angel, kind of like this cat back here. Hey, hey. <sighs> yeah, we're not talking about some angel, but even devils have rights in the United States. Remember, we all have to have rights or else we could just selectively enforce non-law against everybody and then what is the freaking purpose? Law is a lot like having herd immunity with vaccinations, etc. If you have enough people that are completely able to disobey the law and nothing happens to them, then we all lose faith in the law and it's pretty much the same thing as if we were lawless to begin with. So we must obey the law and we must make sure that the law reflects core virtues and values that apply to everyone. Let's continue with the argument. The exercise of this court's, the Supreme Court's, superintendent's powers under GLC 211.3 is appropriate because the Commonwealth has no other avenue appellate review. A petition under this section is the appropriate avenue to review Judge Sinnott's refusal to accept the null prosecchi and arraignment of the defendant over the Commonwealth's objection. Now, this could be skipped. We could just skip this. Why would we not skip this? Because this goes straight to separation of powers, to checks and balances. Why do we have a judicial branch that checks the power of the legislative and executive branches? Why do we have an executive that executes the laws set forth by the legislative branch as interpreted by the judicial branch? Why do we have a separate legislative branch that makes the laws separate from policing and executing them or interpreting them? This is why. You're going to see why. The Commonwealth has the authority to null process a criminal complaint once process has issued. Section 3 in part grants to the Supreme Judicial Court general superintendents of all courts of inferior jurisdiction to correct and prevent errors and abuses therein if no other remedy is expressly provided. As a general rule, in criminal cases, the court's superintendent's powers are exercised upon petition by the Commonwealth where, one, there are substantial errors or abuses of substantive rights in a lower court, and two, the Commonwealth has no other appellate remedy. Here, the judge's refusal to accept the Commonwealth's null prosecchi is not reviewable any, 
under any other established procedure. Not only will the Commonwealth be forced to proceed on a criminal case it deemed inappropriate for prosecution in violation of the separation of powers under Article 30 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, but the defendant will now suffer from a criminal record created as a result of the judge's unconstitutional decision to step out from behind the bench and step into the shoes of the prosecutor. You want activist judges? This is a judge crossing the line and saying that they have these, this belief that they think these protesters should be punished more and the prosecutor's not doing enough, so the judge is going to cross the line into the prosecutor's role, into the executive branch's role, and and, 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 and hold these null prosecutions void and continue arraigning the case and continue with the trial of the case. How is this even going to continue to work? If the prosecutor doesn't want to prosecute the case, what's the judge going to do? Sit there and, 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 and ask all the questions and present all the evidence? What? The following day, the judge's behavior escalated. As the Commonwealth attempted to null pros a complaint charging another person with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest, her attorney attempted to place on record her objection to the judge's refusal to accept the null prosecute that she cited case authority. Supporting her objection, Judge Sinnott held her in contempt of court. Several hours later, following lunch break, the judge released counsel from the cell where he had ordered her held. And that was our video that we released last uh, Saturday, I think it was. So go watch that video if you want to see what I thought about that. The Commonwealth has a substantial interest in checking unconstitutional overstepping by the judiciary into valid exercises of prosecutorial discretion in direct contravention of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights and this court's precedent. So that whole section was about establishing that this is the right vehicle, the right procedure to challenge the judge's decision. Because the Commonwealth's right to file a null prosecute is unquestioned and final, in the interests of justice, the single justice must order the trial court to recognize the Commonwealth's null prosecute, vacate the defendant's arraignment, and expunge the record of that arrangement. arraignment. A district attorney has the absolute power to enter a null prosecute on her official responsibility without the approval or intervention of the court. She alone is answerable for the exercise of her discretion in this particular case. Her action is final. By refusing to accept the null prosecchi and terminate prosecution of this criminal complaint, the judge violated the separation of powers. Article 30 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights provides, in the government of this commonwealth, the legislative department shall never exercise the executive and judicial powers, or either of them. The executive shall never exercise the legislative and judicial powers, or either of them, and the judicial shall never exercise the legislative and executive powers, or either of them. To the end, it may be a government of laws, and not of men. That is really cool, right? That's the Massachusetts Constitution, you know, live free or die. Yeah! Without intervention from this court, the Boston Municipal Court will be allowed to become the government of men, rejected by our founding fathers. A court is not a prosecuting officer and does not act as attorney for the Commonwealth. I lost it, hang on. Its, its office is judicial, to hear and determine between the Commonwealth and the defendant. This well-settled prosecutorial right is also codified in the rules of criminal procedure. A prosecuting attorney may never, a prosecuting attorney may enter a null prosecchi of pending charges at any time prior to the pronouncement of sentence. The power to enter a null prosecchi is absolute. The district attorney's absolute power was exercised here only after a reasoned calculus to forego prosecution that carefully balanced resource allocation with public safety concerns based on the facts of the case. The judge's interference with the district attorney's constitutional authority cannot stand. 
And let's be clear here, the prosecutor is saying that she has considered whether this person's case really is something that's worth the Commonwealth's time in prosecuting, that it's worth getting this person a criminal record, that it's worth taking time and effort and energy away from more egregious cases. Remember, none, no government gives the prosecutor, let alone the public defender, enough resources to prosecute every single case. Can you imagine if a police officer was required to give tickets to every single speeder and then go to court? against every single speeder. Okay, great. Well, we would have a lot less speeders real quick now, wouldn't we? Probably. However, that, uh, that police officer probably doesn't have the physical amount of time to give out hundreds of tickets and attend hundreds of court hearings uh, a week or a day. So there would have to be a massive increase in the number of police and a massive increase in the number of resources allocated to those police. Even though tickets do come with fines and all that, it does end up costing something to prosecute. A speeding ticket does not necessarily pay for every dollar that is spent in paying a police officer and the city's insurance and keeping police cars maintained, etc., 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 etc. There will still have to be taxes, and those taxes have to be allocated to the most egregious cases, not to the least egregious cases. So the prosecutor, I can't believe I'm defending this, the prosecutor has the right to dismiss cases pretty much at will whenever the prosecutor truly believes that a case falls within a category of cases that they simply don't have time to prosecute and aren't bad enough. So let's keep going. The Commonwealth's request for relief today is unusual in part because the power of a null prosecchi has been unquestioned in the Commonwealth's jurisprudence, or case history. In the past, though, this court has had many opportunities to restrain judicial overreach created through the improper dismissal of complaints or indictments. So wait a second, whoa, whoa, whoa. let's read that one again. In the past, this court has had many opportunities to restrain judicial overreach, that's what we're talking about here, right? created through the improper dismissal, improper dismissal of the complaints or indictments. Because the district attorney has employed the Noel Prosecchi to focus her limited resources on the prosecution of serious and violent crimes and not in the pursuit of certain low-level offenses, let's see what the footnote says. There's a Rachel Rollins policy memo at Suffolk-DistrictAttorney.com. I don't know if that means that this is an attorney, Rachel Rollins. I think it probably is. Let's, let's continue. This court must restrain the trial court from leaving the bench to engage in improper prosecution. Quote, the district attorney is the people's elected advocate for a broad spectrum of societal interests, from ensuring that criminals are punished for wrongdoing to allocating limited resources to maximize public protection. Simply put, the judge here is only a referee. The judge's reliance on the Victim Rights Act to deny the Noel Prosecchi is also in error. First, even where the Victim's Rights Statute is an impediment, to termination of a prosecution by Noel Prosecchi, a statute cannot trump the constitutional authority vested in the executive branch. Legislature's creation of a privilege cannot trump a defendant's constitutional right to fair trial, or statute does not rest from the Commonwealth the authority to decide how to execute its prosecutorial discretion. Second, this court should reject the judge's tortured determination that the parade participants were somehow victims of the defendant's exercise of his right to protest. This unconvincing interpretation is, quite frankly, an insult to actual victims. Even so, the Victims' Rights Bill has no requirement to notify a victim of disorderly conduct as a prerequisite to the termination of a prosecution by Noel Prosecchi. But see this case, Bell v. Kelly, one who suffered direct financial harm can be a victim. For all these reasons, 
the judge's reliance on the victim bill of rights here too must be set aside. In conclusion, the judge's actions short-circuited the adversary process by silencing the people's elected voice. For the foregoing reasons, the Commonwealth respectfully requests that this court exercise its powers pursuant to GLC 211 Section 3 to order the trial court to recognize that Commonwealth's null prosecchi vacate the defendant's arraignment and expunge the criminal record created by the unlawful arraignment. And this is District Attorney Rachel Rollins. So then, the court rules. What do you think the Supreme Court had to say? This is the Supreme Judicial Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This matter, became, this matter came before the court, Judge Gaziano, or should I say Justice Gaziano, on the Commonwealth's emergency petition for relief from a Boston Municipal Court judge's refusal to accept entry of a null prosecchi by the Commonwealth in this case, where a complaint had issued against the defendant for disorderly conduct. Uh, under GLC 272, Section 53B. The standard of review, uh, law students, listen up, the standard of review and scope of review are really tough, so you're going to want to hear this a whole bunch of times. The standard of review and scope of review determine how the court can look at the lower court's case and what they can do and what what they're limited to. Can they look at new evidence? Can they look at only the court's record? So the scope of review is the level of evidence they can look at. The standard of review is, is, is what they can do. Uh, de novo would be brand new review. The court's gonna, gonna cite a different standard of review here. Relief under GLC 211.3 is extraordinary and shall be granted only where the petitioner establishes substantial harm to a substantive right that cannot be remedied in ordinary course. Here the Commonwealth has established that it is entitled to such relief. The judge's refusal to accept the Commonwealth's entry of a null prosecchi on the purported ground of a violation of 258b3g precluded the Commonwealth from exercising a fundamental right guaranteed by Article 30 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights. The judge's decision purporting to deny the entry of a null prosecchi and apparently requiring the Commonwealth to prosecute a case it has deemed inappropriate for prosecution is not reviewable any under any other established procedure. Discussion and authority under Article 30. Fundamentally, the judge has no authority to deny the Commonwealth's entry of a null prosecchi. His effort to do so violated the Commonwealth's constitutional rights under Article 30 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights and infringed upon the separation of powers enshrined therein. In the government of this Commonwealth, the legislative department shall never exercise the executive and judicial powers or either of them. The executive shall never exercise the legislative and judicial powers or either of them. And the judicial shall never exercise legislative and executive powers or either of them. To the end, it may be a government of laws and not men. The Article 30 Declaration of Rights of the Massachusetts Constitution is cited. In the context of criminal prosecutions, the executive power affords prosecutors wide discretion in deciding whether to prosecute a particular defendant and the discretion, and that discretion is exclusive to them. The prosecutor's sole authority to determine which cases to prosecute and when not to pursue a prosecution has been affirmed repeatedly by this court since the beginning of the 19th century. The power of entering a null prosecchi is to be exercised at the discretion of the attorney who prosecutes for the government. And for its exercise, he or she alone is responsible. See Commonwealth v. Gordon from 1991, noting long-standing propositions that the decision to null pros a criminal case is within the discretion of the executive branch of government free from judicial intervention. And cases, other, other cases citing, cited, a district attorney has wide discretion in determining whether to prosecute an individual, just as he or she has wide discretion in determining whether to discontinue a prosecution once confessed, commenced. 
On to the victim's Bill of Rights. At the hearing, the judge issued an oral order that the Commonwealth's motion to enter a null prosecchi was denied. This language also appears in a margin notation on the Commonwealth's filing. The judge stated at the hearing over the Commonwealth's repeated objections that the ground of denial was that the Commonwealth had failed to comply with the provisions of GLC 258, Section 3G, that it notify the victims of the offense so that they could appear at the hearing or have an opportunity to confer with the prosecutor prior to the termination of the case. According to the judge, the victims of the defendant's alleged disorderly conduct are members of the Super Happy Fun America Parade, whose one-mile straight pride parade the defendant and approximately 2,000 others were protesting. The judge determined that the defendant's actions interfered with the marcher's exercise of their rights to free speech under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. This was error for several reasons. First, the offense of disorderly conduct is an offense against the public at large and not against a specific victim. See Commonwealth v. Achimi, a 2017 case. The General Law, Section 272, section, or General Laws, C, codified, 272 section, that's a disorderly conduct statute, provides that being a disorderly person and disturber of the peace is a criminal offense punished by a fine for the first offense. In order to interpret the term and ensure its constitutionality, this court has engrafted the model penal code definition of disorderly into onto the separate section 53 offense of being a disorderly person. As so construed, the disorderly conduct provision in section 53 requires proof that a person with purpose to cause public inconvenience, annoyance, or alarm, or recklessly creates a risk thereof, engages in fighting, or threatening, or in violent or tumultuous behavior, or created a hazardous or physically offensive condition by any act which serves no legitimate purpose of the actor. The comments to the Model Penal Code emphasize that nothing less than conscious disregard of a substantial and unjustifiable risk of public nuisance will suffice for liability. Thus, there were no specific victims to notify regarding the Commonwealth's decision to enter a null prosecchi on the complaint of disorderly conduct. So let me address for a moment the people in the comments who are saying that uh, the counter-protesters win again! They can just get away with anything. You, you might just be a victim of your own hyperbole and bias. If you are paying attention and listening here, the model penal code and the way that the Massachusetts General Assembly interprets it and the way that the Massachusetts courts interpret it require the conscious disregard of a substantial and unjustifiable risk of public nuisance. So you watched the video, right? You were here for the video. That guy wasn't making a conscious disregard of the public or creating a substantial and unjustifiable risk. Maybe he was being a jerk. I'll give you that. He's certainly no angel. I'm not defending his actions. But I certainly can see how Rachel Rollins, the district attorney of Boston, has decided that maybe his case isn't the kind of thing that we need to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. He didn't beat the ride, he spent some time in jail, he got arraigned, all this stuff happened to him. So at what point is it okay for the prosecutor to say, okay, this particular guy, catch and release, let him go. Second, even had there been victims of an offense who had not been notified, the judge had no authority to deny the Commonwealth's entry of a null prosecchi. General Laws number 258, Section B, the Disorderly Conduct Statute, does not trump the Commonwealth's constitutional right to determine when to enter a null prosecchi, nor vest that authority in a trial judge. See the Declaration of Rights and the Commonwealth v. Hart case from 1889. Only an attorney authorized by the Commonwealth to represent it has authority to declare that he or she will not further prosecute a case in behalf of the Commonwealth. A court is not a prosecuting officer and does not act as the authority. 
and does not act as the attorney for the Commonwealth. Its office is judicial, to hear and determine between the Commonwealth and the defendant. The fact that no authorized attorney for the Commonwealth is before the court does not give to it the character and authority of an attorney. A court may terminate a prosecution by discharging a defendant before trial or during trial, but it is by judgment of this court and not by act of the prosecuting officer. Another case, Commonwealth v. Brandano from 1971, a district attorney has the absolute power to enter a null prosecchi on his official responsibility without the approval or intervention of the court. He or she alone is answerable for the exercise of his or her discretion in this particular. His or her action is final. That means the prosecutor can be held accountable for prosecutorial discretion decisions. And you'll see in a moment that there is actually one more way that a prosecutor can be held accountable. But the major way is to the electorate. If the people of Boston do not like what Rachel Rollins has done here, they are welcome to not re-elect her. And let's continue. To be sure, in some rare circumstances, the Commonwealth's authority to enter a null prosecchi has been curtailed. Prior to trial, the power to enter a null prosecchi is absolute in the prosecutor, except possibly in instances of scandalous abuse of authority. And then there's a footnote here. For example, after jeopardy attaches, the prosecutor's authority to enter a null prosecchi gives way to the defendant's right to have that tribunal pass upon his guilt by verdict and thus secure a bar to another prosecution for the same offense. So the prosecutor can't dismiss after jeopardy attaches or basically after the trial begins. Here, the prosecutor in the exercise of her constitutionally guaranteed discretion decided that the public's interests would be best served by dropping the charge of disorderly conduct against the defendant. Such a decision in which a prosecutor decides how to allocate her limited resources is made countless times every day in courthouses throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the nation, frankly. The entry of a null prosecchi in this case hardly qualifies as a scandalous abuse of authority warranting judicial intervention. Let me read that one more time for emphasis. The entry of a null prosecchi in this case, in the opinion of the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, hardly qualifies as a scandalous abuse of authority, warranting judicial intervention. On to expungement. The Commonwealth requests also that the defendant's record as a result of this incident be expunged from Boston Municipal Court, Commissioner of Probation, and Boston Police Department files. Ordinarily, when a null prosecchi is entered in a case, the appropriate action is to protect defendant's privacy and avoid potential negative consequences, among other things, with respect to housing, employment, loan applications, and is an order to seal the records. That means when null prost, the charges are dismissed and the record is sealed. No more public access to the charges. Nonetheless, a court has inherent power to order expungement, and in certain cases, expungement is appropriate. See Police Commissioner of Boston versus Municipal Court of Dorchester. The judicial remedy of expungement is inherent and is not dependent on express statutory provision, and it exists to vindicate substantial rights provided by statute as well as organic law. Quote, in determining whether the remedy of sealing is the exclusive option, the critique question the critical question is whether the records accurately reflect the charging decision made by the prosecution and the police. Where a statute might generally apply, a court may still have inherent authority to expunge at least some kinds of records in rare and limited circumstances where the judge has found, by clear and convincing evidence, that the order was obtained through fraud on the court. In addition, in circumstances such as these, expungement is explicitly provided for by statute. C. GLC 276, section 100K, A, and A6. Notwithstanding the requirements of other sections, a court may order the expungement of a record created as a result of a criminal court appearance, juvenile court appearance, or dispositions, 
if the court determines based on clear and convincing evidence that the record was created as a result of demonstrable errors by court employees. Upon consideration, it is ordered that the petition for extraordinary relief <laughs> that the petition for extraordinary relief shall be and hereby is allowed or granted. The arraignment shall be vacated and set aside. The matter is remanded to the Boston Municipal Court for entry of the Commonwealth's Noel Prosecchi in this case. It is further ordered that the Commonwealth's motion to expunge the defendant's criminal record created as a result of the improper arraignment, where the Commonwealth repeatedly requested that no arraignment take place, shall be and hereby is allowed. The clerk of the Boston Municipal Court Central Division shall expunge all records of the matter from its files and shall notify the Commissioner of Probation and the Criminal History Systems Board to do so as well by the court, Judge or Justice Gaziano. So, what do you think of that? In my professional and personal opinion, that is the right decision. That protester, again, not an angel, certainly a jerk, didn't do anything super terribly or rather substantially wrong, creating an unjustified risk of harm to the public at large. Instead, they were being an annoying protester blocking the road. That was where it ended when the police finally moved in to disperse the crowd physically. That protester turned tail and ran, and they took him to the ground and arrested him. And that was really the extent of it. And is that really the level of offense that we want to begin giving police authority for in this country? Do you, do you really look at the state of things in the United States, the status of things, and say, yes, police need to start arresting people for shouting obscenities and blocking a road for a little while? Certainly, the arrest, I understand, and in more egregious cases, yeah, I could see disorderly conduct charges not being dismissed. You may remember that I have had, I, I have brought, or rather I have been the victim of people, whatever, and then disorderly conduct charges were brought. And those charges were not dismissed because that was assault and that was impersonating a police officer and everything. So they ended up dismissing the disorderly conduct charges as part of a plea deal where the assault and impersonation charges stuck. So yeah, the, the prosecutor made the right decision here. And even if you believe the prosecutor didn't make the right decision, at least now you know what the standard is. And if those protesters, if this person and the guy with the boot on his head and you know anybody else who was protesting this march wanted to be more effective, they should have stayed away from the road, stayed on the sidewalk, and ch chanted their disregard, chanted their protest from the sidewalk physically intervening in someone else's First Amendment rights to protest or assemble, that's where you start to cross the line. You're allowed to protest. They're allowed to protest. They're allowed to march. What you're not allowed to do is interact in a way that interferes physically. You can shout, you can yell, you can chant, you can sing. I would prefer the singing, actually. But what you should not do is physically intervene. That is where it becomes an offense. And the police can move in and arrest you. And maybe you won't get the charges dismissed because this was the discretion of the prosecutor. And you can see how bad, how bad this judge really, really wanted to protest, really, really wanted to hold this protester accountable for the situation that was created. Now, there were other protesters who did not get their charges dismissed. I don't have all the files. We were able to get this one file, and this was a great example of what happened. There were other protesters whose cases were not dismissed because they did resist arrest in a more egregious fashion, or they did throw things at police officers and such. And those people will probably still be prosecuted, or more likely they'll plead guilty or enter a plea deal of some kind. And that's how the judicial system is supposed to work. 
I agree that it's not perfect, but hear me out. Again, if we, if we made sure that the police had resources and, and the number of police officers was so large that we could actually arrest everyone for every single offense, not only would we well, we're already the country that incarcerates the most people. And looking at the comments here, I can see why. So many of you want to throw this person in jail for the rest of their lives as a terrorist because they protested and ran away from a police officer after blocking a road. There's a spectrum here. And I've lived a rather large part of my life with people who don't believe that there is anything less than a binary yes or no to, the, to everything in the entire world. And I disagree. There is a spectrum for everything in the entire world. And it's the nuances. It's we need to see the colors in the spectrum. We need to look at everything. We need to look at the facts. We need to look at why we're doing things. Why, why do we have laws? Why do we enforce laws? What exactly are we trying to achieve here? Are we trying to have a totalitarian government where you only get to live in peace and harmony if you agree with whoever the Supreme leader of the United States is? No. We have a government for the people, by the people, of the people. It is a government that serves the people, not people serve their government. And that's why everyone gets equal rights and everyone gets equal protection under the law and everyone gets due process and everyone can speak out and report on the news or report on events, can have their religion, can even have firearms. And these are the rights that we protect for law-abiding citizens. The law does not mean you must agree with the supreme leader or somebody's version of of a, of a virtue. It's the open interpretation of our constitutions of law that applies to everyone. So let me know what you think in the chat and in the comments below. That is pretty much my entire thing. And I will pivot over to a little bit of an outro now. So thank you for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Joining me, there is nobody in the studio, but thank you to Blackleaf for popping in and alerting me to the error with the thing. This is a community-supported legal education channel. We are trying to take this to the next level. We are about to go full-time with our editor, meaning we might actually be able to do more than one video a day, and they might be able to be very well edited with graphics and cuts and fly-ins and everything that you've ever wanted. So. Please consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ljfrench or sponsus.com slash law, as those are the platforms that help us keep going when YouTube demonetizes our video. We released an, or we we're gonna release an Ariana Grande lookalike video today. She's suing somebody for having a Forever 21. She's suing Forever 21 for having a lookalike model. Well, it's copyright and trademark infringement, right? Well, what if it's just a lookalike? So we're gonna go over that as soon as YouTube is willing to remonetize our video. That didn't violate anything whatsoever of YouTube's. So not really sure what happened there. So thank you for all of your support. Thank you very much to our supporters in the month of September. Joshua Davis of Tanda Pay is supporting us at the $1,000 level. We are working on a video that we are now ready to produce and drop by next Monday. So we expect to have the Tanda Pay video out next Monday. Please go see his medium.com articles in the description of this video below. Thank you very much to Joshua Davis and Tanda Pay. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Michael Pierce, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Snorri Wazatsky, Joe Tyson, and Blackleaf. And thank you to all of our other supporters who are in the description below. And I would normally put a crawl up here, but this is a live stream and I haven't done that. So thank you for the $2, Joe Tyson. And there's a bunch of other super chats to thank. Let me quick see if I can get this up here. Once, wait, it's, it's here on the live, uh, the live thing somewhere, right? Nope, they took the super chats away from the live control room. Viewer activity, maybe? Is that what it's under now? Let's see. Yep, thank you to Joe Tyson for the $10. Thank you to Heinrich Berndowski for $2. Thank you for two euros. Thank you for to Velodia for the 40 rubles. And again, Joe Tyson for the $2. 
really, really appreciate it. So thank you for joining me. Really appreciate you all coming here. Have a great day, a great week. I will see you for the Wednesday show. I have no idea when it will be because I'm in Luxembourg and I'm six hours ahead of the U of US time. Uh, but we'll see you sometime tomorrow for a live show. And I'll see you in the videos that drop and I'll see you on Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern time on twitch.tv slash lawful masses. Love you all. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Bye.